feels like a scene from a climate change dystopia. A world in which 80% of all land has been rendered uninhabitable by human greed. Once lush forests replaced by a toxic desert. A world in which the groundwater is poisoned and all of humanity is forced to survive on a narrow, survivable strip of land between desert and ocean, even as the waves rise ever higher. No, this isn't the synopsis for some new Netflix satire, a much more depressing companion piece to 2021's Don't Look Up. The place that I just described, it really exists. A real-life island state that today stands as a stark warning to the rest of the world. And that island's name is Nauru, and it was ground zero for an environmental apocalypse. It wasn't meant to be this way. In the early 1980s, Nauru was, per capita, one of the richest nations on Earth. Its government oversaw a sovereign wealth fund sufficient to keep its entire population in luxury for centuries to come. Yet these days, the nation stands as a broke, near uninhabitable wasteland, a place of poverty and of desperation. It is the story of this traumatic change that's going to lie at the very heart of today's video. So picture your idea of an island paradise. We're guessing it might be somewhere tropical, near the equator. And we're guessing also that it'll be isolated, far from the madding crowd. Somewhere with clear waters, with white sands, natural riches. Somewhere, in other words, just like Nauru. A tiny speck of land, a third the size of Manhattan, the Republic of Nauru, sits a mere 48 kilometers south of the equator, out in the Pacific's wild blue yonder. It's populated by a mere 12,511 people, and it's over 300 kilometers away from the nearest other island, Manaba, itself the extreme westernmost part of Kiribati. The only place its airline regularly flies to, Brisbane in Australia, is thousands of kilometers distant. Nor is it just where isolation is concerned that Nauru seems like the perfect getaway. A raised coral atoll ringed by white sands dotted with palm trees, Nauru from the air appears insta-ready, the sort of place depressed office workers dream about escaping to. But if you look a little closer, you'll start to see that this is all a bit of an illusion, a mirage created by distance and by expectation. You see, as your plane gets closer, it will quickly become apparent that, rather than a tropical paradise, Nauru is instead an ecological nightmare. The island is becoming a wilderness. The phosphate will all be gone in 20 years, leaving nothing but a barren rock behind. Deposits dried up, the revenue squandered. However, the primary supplies of phosphate were depleted in the 1990s. That ring of sand and palm trees around the islands, well, it turns out that that is the only habitable part, a 274 meter wide zone where nearly all life on Nauru is forced to take place. The bulk of the island's 21 square kilometers is nothing but a toxic desert, a world of jagged limestone peaks and fine irritating dust where absolutely nothing can grow. Known as Topside, it spent decades as the source of Nauru's unmatched wealth. Today, though, Topside is responsible for all of the nation's ills, the place that contaminated much of the sparse groundwater, leaving the population reliant on a malfunctioning desalination plant. A landscape where nothing could be cultivated, leading to locals' dependence on highly processed imported foods. Speaking of the locals, they're thought to be some of the sickest people on Earth. With extreme rates of obesity, Nauru is one of the world's fattest nations as well as one with among the highest rates of smoking, of diabetes, and of alcoholism. That last one, in turn, gives rise to high rates of domestic violence and other antisocial behavior like drunk driving, a weirdly impressive feat when you consider that the island only has a single road. Not that the sense of sickness stops with the citizens, though. MIT Reader ran an article in 2019 about what life is like on the island, which included this rather grim sentence, desperation seems to pervade all of Nauru. Among other problems the article listed were the high rate of unemployment, the crumbling houses and aging infrastructure, and the rotting garbage that's just piling up on the roadside. In short, the vibe on Nauru is less Pacific Island getaway and more post-apocalyptic sci-fi. One where the main threat isn't zombies, but a suffocating sense of despair caused by ecological breakdown. Because, make no mistake, this microscopic nation didn't always look like this. Just 40 years ago, it was the envy of the world. 
In the 1980s, Nauruans were second only to Saudis in terms of wealth as GDP per capita. Locals drove luxury sports cars and used money as toilet paper. The government owned a fleet of cruise ships and a loss-making airline and once blew $400,000 on what the New York Times called a floating cocktail lounge. Citizens were guaranteed employment with free access to healthcare, education, and opportunities to study abroad. Meanwhile, a trust fund had already amassed $400 million and was projected to reach a billion dollars by the 1990s, equivalent to roughly $2.3 billion in today's money. And that's all for a nation of barely 12,000 people. The obvious question then is what happens? What caused Nauru's spectacular nosedive from the very pinnacle of global wealth rankings to somewhere near the very bottom. And the answer lies not in some inherent fecklessness among the locals, but in an all-too-human foible. Greed. Greed on the part of outsiders, on the part of corporations, and yes, on the part of the Nauran elites. A rapacious greed that could one day leave the rest of the world as broken and benighted as Nauru. When discussing the complexities of cause and effect, the cliché is to evoke a butterfly. You know, that old chestnut about how a single butterfly beating its wings in China can eventually cause a tornado in Delaware, or a man's pants to unexpectedly fall down in Ireland, or something equally absurd. Really though, the cliché should probably evoke doorstops in Australia, because it was the precise placing of one such doorstop in 1899 that led to Nauru becoming a wasteland. The exact sequence of events that brought that doorstop to the Sydney office of the Pacific Islands Company has sadly been lost to history. What we do know is that it came from Nauru. We know too that whoever found it assumed that it was petrified wood. Sadly for the fate of the islands, there was someone working at the Sydney office who just happened to know a whole lot about petrified wood. Someone who was both observant enough and boring enough to be all like, mind if I borrow that doorstop to run some tests? It's not like I'm doing anything this weekend. That observant but dull dude's name was Albert Fuller Ellis. It was his fateful encounter with that very doorstop that would destroy Nauru's future more assuredly than the beating wings of any random butterfly. At the time Ellis was running his tests, Nauru looked very different, closer to the perfect tropical paradise that we talked about at the start of today's video. Rather than blasted desert, the interior of the island, the region known as Topside, was a place of almonds and pandanus trees, a lush green world filled with the cries of migrating birds. So pristine was the place that, despite being annexed by Germany, it still retained the name bestowed on it by the British man who first sighted it, Pleasant Island. But Pleasant Island held a secret one hinted at by the cries of those birds. Back in the ancient past, Nauru had repeatedly risen and sunk beneath the waves. As a result, the coral at its center became covered in marine deposits, deposits that were later added to by migrating birds, emptying their bowels over it across millions of years. Trapped between jagged spikes of coral in the island center, those marine and bird ass deposits eventually formed phosphate of an astonishing purity. Phosphate, a chunk of which some forgotten person had mistaken for petrified wood and brought back to Sydney, leaving it right where Ellis was gonna find it. As a trained geologist, Ellis was all too aware of what phosphate could be used for. It could be used as a fertilizer to produce spectacular harvests. More to the point, he knew what it was worth. After taking a trip to Nauru and confirming the extent of the deposits, Ellis reported back to the Naurans that they were living atop an island forged from the whitest of golds. So, his colleagues did what any corporation would do in that period. They struck an agreement with Nauru's colonial overlords to exploit Topside for all it was worth. Starting in 1905, first under German supervision, and then Australian after Canberra annexed Nauru in World War I, the newly renamed Pacific Phosphate Company oversaw the strip mining of Nauru's interior. Unlike underground mining, strip mining involves removing all the rocks and the soil above a deposit, turning the whole site into an open cast pit. Now, the advantages of this method is that it's really cheap. The disadvantage is that it is unbelievably destructive. On topside, trees, ferns, and bushes that had grown there for decades were cleared, the topsoil was removed, and the phosphate below it was extracted, leaving behind a wasteland that could never be used again. As early as 1921, a visiting National Geographic reporter was able to write of the process to quote, A worked out phosphate field is a dismal, ghastly track of lands. This all could they have known. But Nauru's age of exploitation is only just beginning.
So despite plundering Nauru for its resources into war, Australians weren't actually total dicks about it. As the island's new colonial masters, they paid local landowners royalties for the regions they were mining and even set up a couple of trust funds for the Nauruan people using profits from the sale of phosphate. But while this may have been enlightened exploitation, it was still exploitation, as could be seen in the cut of the profits that was offered to Naurans. As the MIT reader put it, the mining of Nauru's phosphate was not outright theft. However, the Nauran share was tiny considering the profits, damage, and cost of restoring mine lands. As the years passed, that damage was only growing, with more and more foreigners taking over the islands. Nauran indigenous culture was effectively wiped out. Australian and European practices replaced traditional ones. The old Nauran religion was replaced with Christianity. Nor was the tiny cut of the profits the islanders were receiving as big as it should have been. Despite exporting 200,000 tons of phosphate annually, Canberra was selling the island's reserves at well under market value, part of a plan to give its own farmers and those of Britain and New Zealand a competitive edge. Again, this wasn't the worst act of colonization in history. When the Empire of Japan seized Nauru during World War II, it conducted a genocidal campaign that killed a quarter of the population. Still, not as bad as Imperial Japan is a pretty low bar to set yourself, which may be why pangs of conscience convinced Australia to offer the Nauruans a brand new island to resettle on in 1963. But Nauru's people didn't want some random new island, they wanted their island, the one their people had lived on for thousands of years, the one Australia, in league with Britain and New Zealand, seemed so intent on destroying. By now, a third of Nauru had been strip mined. A swath of land in the island's south had disappeared, replaced by jagged limestone pillars. Ironically, it was this destruction that would soon see Canberra lose control of its colony. The engine for Nauru's eventual independence was local council leader Hamada Robert. Educated in Australia, De Robert was a master at speaking to the colonists in ways they could understand, of using the example of Nauru's strip mine south to eloquently push the case for the island's independence. By the late 1960s, it was clear the world was on his side. Rather than fight to hold on to the colony, Canberra let Nauru slip through its fingers. At the moment that Nauru stepped into the bright light of independence in 1968, the island was the smallest republic in the world. The only smaller countries, Monaco and Vatican City, were both monarchies. Among democracies, Nauru was uniquely tiny. And that meant it came with a unique set of challenges, one that made many wonder if this microscopic new nation could even survive. The problem was, everyone could see that the remaining deposits would run out in a generation or so, a generation in which the island's interior would be completely destroyed. And it's here that we get to the relevance of Nauru's story to our planet today. Like many of us in 2023, the Nauruans in 1968 were faced with a choice. Change their behavior and try to preserve what remained of their paradise, or keep on as they had been before, and trust that economic growth today could shield against ecological disaster tomorrow. In the end, Hamid Robert and his fellow Nauran elites chose the latter. It was a decision that would make them fabulously rich, while also condemning their descendants to live lives of desperate poverty. We had money. It was like partying every day, and no one thought of the future. In 2008, this was how landowner Daniki Capé described Nauru's boom years to the Telegraph. While Capé's reminiscences were tinged with dark shades of regret, that quote gets at something essential about life on the island in the two decades post-independence. Living through it was like taking part in the biggest, most destructive party that the world has ever thrown. Forget 1980s New York, or Bubble Era Tokyo, or Klondike during the Gold Rush. Nauru in the 1970s and 80s was a place where easy money and giddy excitement combined to create a lethal cocktail of hedonism. First, the expensive but reasonable stuff. The ways the government splashed out to ensure all citizens took part in this boom. At the Scandinavian end of the scale, this involved making all public services free. Healthcare, education, dental care, even public transport was completely subsidized. Further up the scale, the government would also pay to put students through prestigious Australian universities. Housing was subsidized too, with monthly rent costing a mere $15.76 in today's money. And finally, at the top end of the scale, is the part that might also be called socialism with money. The part where the government guaranteed a job for anyone who wanted one and abolished all forms of income tax so people could enjoy their earnings. As the New York Times put it in 1982, Nauru comes close to being the ultimate welfare state. But then, 
President de Robert and his government, they could afford to be generous. With around 2 million tons of phosphate being extracted every year, Nauru was raking in the equivalent in today's dollars of 2.5 billion annually. By 1975, a royalties trust designed to act as an insurance against the future had crossed the one billion Australian dollars mark. And what the government didn't save, it was more than happy to spend. And it's here that we come to our second tally of expenditure, the completely unreasonable things Nauru blew its money on. Despite being a nation of only around 10,000 citizens, Nauru owned a fleet of cruise ships and overseas hotels, as oh well as a loss-making airline that flew all over the Pacific. Officials blew piles of cash on luxury cars, including an infamous local police chief who imported a Lamborghini only to realize that he was too overweight to fit inside it. Hamid Robert, meanwhile, took a limousine to work every single day. And just in case you had forgotten, here's a quick reminder that all of this is in a country with a single road. By the way, that road's 30 kilometers long. Questionable as these purchases were, though, they've got nothing on the buildings. During the boom years, the Nauran government went on a buying spree so wild it managed to do with real estate what Imelda Marcos once did with shoes. Expensive hotels in Sydney and Carlton were snapped up, as were properties on Guam, Samoa, and the Marshall Islands. An office building topped with a revolving restaurant was built in the northern Marianas for $7 million. $400,000 was blown on a floating cocktail lounge. But the bloated cherry on top of this wasteful cake has to be the Nauru House in Melbourne. Standing 50 stories high, it was built at a cost of $45 million. Speaking of the Times, President Aroba proudly proclaimed of the buildings, airlines, and cruise ships, these are very deliberately promoted operations that we think in the long run will pay. Yet, for all of the staggering waste on display so far, perhaps nothing can compare to the West End musical. Yet... Yeah. You heard that right. Toward the end of the boom in the early 1990s, the Nauran government decided to spend $7 million funding a musical about the life of Leonardo da Vinci. That's at this point that the tale of Nauru can't help but descend into... It's just a farce. Written by the former roadie of a British one-hit wonder band and featuring scenes in which da Vinci slaps the Mona Lisa on the arse to seduce her, the musical got financed after Nauran's president's advisors played him a demo tape. Opening in London in 1993, it was the closest real-life equivalent yet staged to springtime for Hitler. The thing became a legendary bomb. But while Mel Brooks's producers had a canny scheme for making money off a stage failure, the same sadly cannot be said for Nauru's government. Not that those in charge particularly cared. In 1982, it was officially estimated that by the time the phosphate ran out, the Nauran Trust Fund would be holding more than a billion dollars, enough to keep every single Nauran family in comfort for generations. At least, that was the official version. Unofficially, though, it was clear Nauru's savings were not all that they were claimed to be. When the Times visited the islands, they were told by an anonymous official that the government had, quote, a chronic cash flow problem. Rumors were already spreading that the money hadn't been invested wisely. Perhaps the attitude of Nauru's elites is best summed up by a quote from former finance minister James Bob when the Times asked him if he was worried. It is a worry, he said, but we have a motto. In Nauran, it means tomorrow will take care of itself. Sadly, for regular Naurans, the motto would turn out to be extremely misguided. One aspect of Nauru's blame that often gets left out of these stories is that it didn't apply equally to everybody. While the local elites were importing sports cars and, in one notable instance, literally using money to wipe their ass, ordinary Naurans saw very little of the phosphate dollars flowing through their economy. The average income on the islands was between five and $6,000 a year. That's the equivalent of just under $20,000 today. Uh, nor were the government handouts enough to buy people off. There's evidence that many regular citizens could see the coming consequences of this wasteful spending and were desperate to stop it. The day the Leonardo musical premiered in London, for example, 100 elites went to fly out to watch it. But they almost didn't make it when protesters rushed the airport, demanding the government stop pissing away their money. By this point, Hamid Robert was dead, yet the government had continued on in his image, still relying on the income from phosphates to survive. The trouble was, that phosphate was about to run out. At the end of the 1980s, Nauru had been exporting 2 million tons a year. By the end of the 1990s, that had dropped to half a million. Come 2005, it was at record low of just 8,000 tons. And while investments in new equipment would soon allow harder to reach phosphate to be harvested, post-2005 annual exports would never exceed 45,000 tons. And as the phosphate ran out, so did the money. 
With good investments, it's been estimated that Nowry's trust fund could have been worth 8 billion Australian dollars by 2004. Instead, a wasteful spending, bad investments, and money lost to scams meant the trust fund's true size was under 30 million dollars. And the price of that relatively paltry sum? The total destruction of their homeland. By the mid-1990s, 80% of Nauru had been strip-mined. Where there had once been trees and wildlife, there was now only a desert of jagged rocks, one on which nothing could ever be grown or built again. You know that Joni Mitchell song uh, where she sings about how they paved paradise and put up a parking lot? Well, at least the they in that song got a parking lot out of it. All Nauru got was a failed musical and an economy based solely on resource extraction. So, you probably guess what when the resources ran out. The end of phosphate mining did to Nauru in society what a well-aimed grenade does to the interior of a clown car, turned what had once been amusing excess into a depressing mess. No money, all those free government services collapsed. Not just the transport and healthcare, but also the entire schooling system. Unemployment peaked at 90%. Yet for all the economic woes of post-boom Nauru, it was the ecological ones that really stood out. Phosphate mining hadn't just created a desolate wasteland that could never be healed. It had also poisoned the island's waters and left the interior covered in fine toxic particles. Particles that get kicked up when the wind blows and create breathing problems. With no arable land, nowhere to forage, it left the entire population dependent on food imports. Imports that came in the form of highly processed foods, contributing to the ongoing obesity and diabetes epidemics. Now imagine for a second how jarring this must have been. The whiplash that must accompany a switch from second richest nation on the planet to broke guys living in an environmental wasteland. Not that the government didn't try to find new revenue streams. Uh, at the saner end of the spectrum, that involved taking Australia to court for its decades of mismanagement prior to independence. In 1994, Canberra settled the case, agreeing to pay $57 million up front and another $50 million over 20 years. The UK and New Zealand paid each additional $12 million for their role as Nauru's joint custodians. At the less sane end, though, it involved doing some stuff that would do to Nauru's reputation what phosphate mining had done to the environment. Utterly destroy it. Now, the term offshore banking probably conjures some specific images. Images that mix pleasant stuff like palm trees and sand beaches with others of extremely wealthy people laughing as they refuse to give even a penny to the tax man. In Nauru's case, though, the government's foray into banking didn't just help the rich evade taxes. It also helped some of the nastiest, most violent people on earth launder colossal sums of money. To make their state attractive to financiers, the government didn't require banks to have any physical presence on the islands, not even a mailbox, nor did it require them to keep any records. As a result, the sort of people interested in banking on Nauru were the exact sort of people who need to hide massive transfers of money from the authorities. The Russian Mafia alone is estimated to have laundered over a billion dollars through the island. The craziest part? Russian mobsters weren't even the island's shadiest customers. That honor probably goes to Al-Qaeda, who banked with Nauru in the run-up to 9-11. Nor was it just banking services that Nauru offered to these criminals. By the mid-1990s, officials were openly selling passports. Now, that's something some countries do even today. Dominica and North Macedonia, for example, will give you citizenship in exchange for large sums of money. Nauru's government, though, didn't just sell regular passports. According to The Guardian, it sold diplomatic passports. As in the passports that provide immunity from prosecution to the holder of them. And when a state is selling diplomatic immunity, while also courting Al-Qaeda and the Russian Mafia, oh well, you can see how that might just be the teeny tiniest bit worrying. When the backlash eventually hit, it was immense. So immense that it dwarfed even the millions of dollars a year that Nauru was receiving in banking fees. In 2002, the US declared the country a money laundering state. Sanctions were slapped on it that equaled those placed on Saddam Hussein's Iraq. The pressure was enough to force Nauru to pass anti-money laundering and anti-terrorist financing laws. But with no other source of income, enforcing those laws soon left Nauru poorer than ever. Completely broke, the island nation was forced to watch its creditors repossessed its airplanes, cruise ships, and even its foreign real estate. Even the 50-story Nauru house in Melbourne was sold off. During this bleak period, just about the only way the government had to make money was by offering recognition to unrecognized states. This included recognizing Russian-backed separatists in places like Abkhazia. In 2003, it also involved taking a massive bribe from China to sever diplomatic relations with Taiwan, only for the government to then take money from Taipei to re-establish relations two years later. 
Aside from that, Nauru's only revenue came from hosting an offshore detention center for Australia, an act that saw it receive millions of dollars per year in visa fees to house asylum seekers Canberra refused to process on its home turf. But while millions of dollars a year might sound like a lot, the truth is that none of these activities were able to support the economy. So Nauru kept doing what it had always done. It kept right on mining for phosphate. Now, if you need a handy metaphor for pointless self-destructive behavior, it's hard to find a better one than this. In 2018, The Guardian reported that Nauru was digging up enough phosphate to make $22 million. The problem? The cost of mining it was $27.5 million. The government was losing over $5 million a year to dig up the last remaining chunks of land that are yet to be strip mined. Now, that's not to say phosphate will never again play a major role in Nauru's economy. With the primary reserves of topside gone, the country is considering how to mine its secondary reserves, chunks of phosphate buried so deep or so hard to get to that cost-effective extraction has only recently become viable. These secondary reserves may total as much as 20 million metric tons, enough perhaps to create a mini-boom. Yet even if phosphate again lifts Nauru's economy, it's not a sustainable solution to the country's woes, and who knows what ecological damage it might cause to the remaining 20% of the island that is still inhabitable. To give some idea of just how destructive phosphate mining has been, consider this anecdote. Since 1993, the Nauru Rehabilitation Corporation has spent $135 million trying to repair land that has been strip mined. In all that time, it's managed to revive just 10 hectares, part of an area known as Pit 6. That is a mere fraction of the 400 hectares originally planned for rehabilitation. At this rate, it's going to take them over a thousand years to reach their target. So this, then, is where we began the video today, with Nauru in poverty and its citizens trapped on the edges of an environmental nightmare, clinging to the last habitable tracts of land even as their government considers mining further. But now you can doubtless see why so many view Nauru's tale as a parable for humanity. A wake-up call for a species that seems determined to keep degrading its planet, even as wildflowers multiply and heat waves bring entire cities to their knees. However, it's not climate change that we want to end today's video talking about, but another potential ecological catastrophe, a catastrophe that could be the second great environmental disaster Nauru has been at the center of. One that won't take place on topside, but at the bottom of the ocean. Were someone to place a deep-sea polymetallic nodule in your hand, chances are you'd be pretty unimpressed. About the size of a potato, these nodules are basically smooth brown rocks that exist at the bottom of the ocean, lying on the seabed some four kilometers below the surface, what Americans might call either two and a half miles or a whole bunch of football pitches. But make no mistake, while these nodules may look small and unimpressive on the outside, it's the same way that mob appears a scrawny, boring middle schooler from afar. Deep inside, both contain a spectacular secret. In Mob's case, it's ESP. In the nodule's case, it's the ability to save the world. The makeup of these nodules you see is stuff like cobalt, nickel, and manganese. Minerals that just happen to be absolutely key in building the batteries that are going to dominate the green energy revolution. And this is important because the International Energy Agency predicts a fourfold increase in demand for these materials by 2040 as humanity struggles to quickly transition off of fossil fuels. The problem is that terrestrial mining may not be able to keep up with the demand. And this is where the nodules come in. Found in rich fields on the seabed, they're particularly clustered in the clarion Clipperton zone, a 4.5 million square kilometer slice of the Pacific. Now, unfortunately for the companies that want to harvest them, it's not quite as simple as just buying a boat, sailing west from California, and making bare profit. No. According to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, the waters outside each nation's exclusive economic zone are places of common heritage. If you want to do any industrial work there, you're going to need the UN's International Seabed Authority to agree. And to get that agreement, you must be sponsored by a recognized nation state. Maybe like a tiny Pacific island in desperate need of cash. As you may have guessed by now, the state Canada's The Metals Company, or TMC, has teamed up with to harvest these nodules is none other than Nauru. Well, technically it's Nauru plus Kiribati and Tonga. 
But Nauru is especially important, and not just because it was the first nation to come on board. It was also the nation that fired the starting gun on nodule harvesting. The first licenses for exploiting these nodules were granted way back in 2011, but the International Seabed Authority dragged its feet on designing regulations to carry out the work, in large part because of worries about environmental damage. But the ISA's rules include a loophole, one which states that the body must approve official applications within two years, even in the absence of regulations. In July of 2021, Nauru went ahead and submitted its application, triggering a 24-month countdown until mining could begin. Now, since you're the sort of intelligent dashing person who watches these videos, you're already aware that July 2021 was more than two years ago. So, you might reasonably ask, what happens with Nauru's application? Well, I'm going to leave you hanging for just the moment. A little mystery there to tantalize you, and we'll be addressing it at the end of the video. But before we get to the end of the video, we do need to grapple with the effects Nauru's application had, why it sparked a wave of global outrage from Fiji to France. The very real worry that deep sea mining may be this generation's phosphate mining. In other words, that Nauru may have fired the starting gun on a whole additional environmental apocalypse. Now, the process of extracting polymetallic nodules from the seabed is relatively straightforward. To explain it, if not actually to do it. Using heavy machinery, companies will hoover up a whole lot of seabed, collecting the nodules on ships, which will then return them to land for processing. But while that might sound pretty simple, it obscures a whole host of complex issues, not least of which is the way this resource extraction might impact the ocean floor. As the New York Times puts it, to quote, scientists say that more is known about the surface of the moon than about the floor of the ocean. Perhaps 90% of the species at the bottom of the Pacific remain unclassified. So that means oh, we can't even begin to predict how removing these nodules will disturb marine ecosystems, even if most scientists are sure that the impacts will be more than negligible. For example, the machinery is likely to churn up sediment at a spectacular rate, potentially destroying fragile habitats. And even if it doesn't, there's the chance that toxic metals will be among those sediments churned up, toxic metals that may be swept upwards in plumes, dragged high into the water to poison marine life forms. Others point to potential for noise from the machinery to damage the ability of whales to communicate with one another, something that could lead to massive disruption in their life cycles. Mostly though, people are worried that we're going to just go and start destroying something that we don't really understand, and the long-term effects of that could be horrifying. As The New Yorker reported last year to quote, hundreds of marine scientists have signed a statement warning that this would be an ecological disaster resulting in damage irreversible on multi-generational timescales. Now, one of the slightly galling things about this is that this damage won't be happening in Nauru's waters. Situated between Hawaii and Mexico, the clarion Clipperton zone is thousands of kilometers from the barren desert of Topside, an environmental disaster here would affect many different places. That may be why there's been a concerted push at the UN to place a moratorium on deep sea mining, a push that includes Pacific states like Fiji, Chile, Panama, Palau, Costa Rica, and New Zealand, but also Atlantic nations like Ireland, France, and Sweden. Standing against them are countries that have already sponsored exploration contracts, countries like China, South Korea, Russia, Jamaica, Brazil, Japan, and France. And yes, France absolutely appeared on both of those lists talking about having your baguette and eating it too. Now, we need to be clear at this point that the potential impact on the seabed is far from settled science. The metals company, the one Nauru is sponsoring, claims that nodule extraction will be less damaging than land-based mining. The Seabed Authority, meanwhile, is at pains to stress that work will only be allowed in 60% of the clarion Clipperton zone. A whole 1.96 million square kilometers is going to be preserved as pristine environment. Yet it may be the official position of Nauru itself that is the most interesting of all. Because rather than an economic activity, the Nauruan government describes deep sea mining as something more existential, a way to save the last habitable part of their damaged nation. With climate change already underway, sea levels are expected to rise in the coming decades. While this is going to suck for everybody, it will be especially awful for low-lying island nations. Although Nauru isn't as low-lying as some, the destruction of Topside means that the only inhabitable parts very close to the waves. According to Nauru's ambassador to the International Seabed Authority, Margot Deye, her country is destined to vanish unless the green transition happens extremely soon. And making the world's economy green is going to require a gigantic increase in certain minerals. Deep sea mining can help with that. 
TMZ estimates that there are enough nodules down there to power 280 million electric vehicles. 280 million vehicles that would otherwise be farting out planet frying gases. Or, as Margot Day has said, the misunderstanding is that any human activity does not have risks. Every activity has risks, but the risk of not doing anything with this current climate crisis is much bigger for us, and it's an existential threat for the Pacific. These, then, are the two sides that stand opposed in this debate. One which believes extracting the seabed's resources could cause a catastrophe, and another that believes that a bigger catastrophe is already happening right now, and we have to do everything we can to try and stop it. As to who's in the right, we can't really say. Unlike George Costanza, we've never claimed to be marine biologists, but what we can say is that the stakes are high. And as we move into the final part of today's video, it is with a massive question hanging over everything. What if we don't figure out who's right until it's already too late? So when the New York Times did a little digging into the contract between TMC and Nauru, what they found didn't exactly paint a flattering picture. According to their reporting, Nauru would receive a tiny fraction of the profits from the deep sea mining. While the exact amount has never been disclosed, the paper did speak to a community leader from the co-sponsoring nation of Tonga, who said that his country had been offered $2 a tonne. Uh, Were well, the same fee applied to Nauru, that would mean the island nation stands to receive less than 0.5% of all profits TMC makes from deep sea mining. As former Tonga parliament member Lord Fusitwa told the paper of record, this company set out to game the system and use a poor developing Pacific nation as the conduit to exploit these resources. You might not be surprised to learn that this is a claim TMC vigorously disputes. Nonetheless, such a setup leaves a bad taste in the mouth, reminiscent as it is of Nauru's past exploitation. It also implies that the fight against climate change may just be a convenient fig leaf, a way for Nauru to ensure some much needed income in the guise of fighting the good fight. With Australia's offshore detention centres coming to an end, the island is about to lose one of its few revenue streams. In such a dire scenario, even a mere half percent of whatever TMC makes would have a positive impact on the Nauru economy. But that's only if the mining ever gets going. You remember back when we said that Nauru had fired the starting on on a two-year countdown to resource extraction back in July of 2021? Well, despite the loophole that should have allowed TMZ to start mining by now, the International Seabed Authority managed to delay the process, giving it more time to finalize regulations. As of this recording, it's now thought that no resource extraction will take place until early 2025, later than the 2024 date TMZ had initially penciled in, but not remarkably so. And when that date arrives, we can finally see for certain what the truth is, whether Nauru is today helping lead the charge toward green energy that will save our planet, or simply playing a bit part in yet another tale of human greed and ecological disaster. A new topside for the 21st century. The scary part is, we'll probably only know with hindsight, while the destruction of topside, the wrecking of Nauru was a tale foretold. It was all too easy to overlook the gloomy predictions in the moment. All too easy for first Arthur F. Ellis, then the Australian colonists, and finally the Nauran elite to ignore the Cassandras, to quietly tell themselves that by the time the phosphate ran out, they'd have fixed the problem. That the miracles of money would allow them to escape the consequences of their short-sighted actions. It's a tale that everyone watching this will see some horrible parallels in. As Antarctic ice levels drop and oceans overheat, as scientists sound warning alarms, how many of our leaders today act like the Nyaran elite of yore? How many shrug and say, tomorrow's going to take care of itself, even as they ensure that tomorrow will be anything but fine? And now here we are, with deep sea mining, potentially standing at the edge of another catastrophe. Another moment when a narrow elite adds up the cost and decides that the benefits to them outweigh the risk to everyone else. It's reasons like this that explain why Nauru's story resonates so strongly. The story of how the richest country in the world destroyed itself. Fittingly, it's a resonance the Naurans themselves are only too aware of. Back in 2011, then-President Marcus Stephan wrote a guest column for The Times, where he set out the parable of Nauru's self-inflicted apocalypse. It reads, 
I'm not looking for sympathy but rather warning you what can happen when a country runs out of options. The world is headed down a similar path, with the relentless burning of coal and oil, which is altering the planet's climate, melting ice caps, making oceans more acidic, and edging us ever closer to a day when no one will be able to take clean water, fertile soil, or abundant food for granted. I forgive you if you've never heard of Nauru, but you will not forgive yourselves if you ignore our story. It's a story that, over 12 years later, is more relevant to our planet's future than it ever has been.